Thank you, Howie, and thank you for coming today. This talk is meant to introduce you to a little bit about what I do and why I do it, but I want to pick up on Howie's introduction and tell you first a little bit about where I do it. I work at this little research institute nestled in the base of the San Gabriel Mountains, which on a really clear, non-polluted day looks like this. Technology has improved the Los Angeles Basin, so it actually does look like this once in a while. It's very small. It's a very special place, home of science greats like Linus Pauling, Richard Feynman, many, many Nobel laureates. But we only have 900 undergraduates, about a little bit more than 1,000 graduate students. Tiny, but we are big for our size, we like to say. And I feel that I've been incredibly lucky. Oh, I should say, um, you know, we have iconic Southern California views like this one and uh, idyllic garden-like settings like this one. My office, my building is right there behind this tree. And a uh, very large part of the year, it actually does look like this. But here, you might think from these pictures that it's a sleepy little place, and it is anything but. We can attract some of the brightest students from all over the world, so you young people in the audience looking for a place to do your PhD, consider Caltech, please, or a postdoc. And then they go out and they do wonderful things. And what is it that, that allows that to happen? I, I was incredibly lucky to start my scientific career in this place 30 years ago, small but big, because it's a home where people are just expected to work on really hard problems and find innovative ways to solve those. So you might have enjoyed the news from the, the gravity wave detection, the first gravity wave detection at the end of last year, at the beginning of this year. That was a project that was started 30 years ago, and it was deemed insane when it was first started. But some insane physicists and set of engineers had to go and think it was possible to build that. So that's where I grew up, when you were expected to do that. The other important aspect of the place is that it, because it's so small, it has a, a, a lack of structure. We, have, we don't have real departments. And any student who comes to Caltech to do a PhD can work for anyone else. So a biologist can become an astrophysicist or an bio astrobiologist, or a geologist can work in a chemistry department. And therefore, I, as a young chemical engineer, could attract a team of microbiologists, molecular biologists, chemists, biochemists, even a few engineers, to come together and try to solve interesting problems. Because the problem that I wanted to solve was how do you engineer the biological world? You can look around you at the simplest of organisms, which are not simple at all, and realize that they have learned how to extract materials and energy from the environment and convert those into moving, adaptive, thinking machines in some cases. And that's amazing chemistry. So as a young person, I decided that this would be a fascinating way to solve human problems. And who does all this chemistry? So I promised to give you a chemistry talk without much chemistry. But what is the chemistry? Who does this conversion of energy and materials into more microbes and into the materials of their daily lives? Those are that chemistry is done by a series of proteins called enzymes. These are the catalysts of life that convert one form of matter into another. And I just show you one example here, an artist's conception of what a single enzyme would look like. This is the enzyme that copies DNA during cell division, reading one strand of DNA and adding all the complementary bases. And this is slowed down a lot so that you can see it. These do chemistry when, where, and how it matters in the living organism. When you look at something like this, you realize, my goodness, here are these molecular machines created by nature over billions of years that solve really complicated problems. 
And because I was scientifically born at the beginning of the DNA revolution, it was natural to think, well, maybe we can begin to engineer these machines not to solve the problem of being alive, but to solve the problem of our being alive, to support human endeavors, and do so in a fashion that mimics what nature can do in a clean way where we utilize materials that are renewable in our environment. All right. So that's one of the many enzymes that life has provided, the polymerase. But humans have been using enzymes for a very long time. It's not a, it's not a new idea to use the biological world to solve human problems. Everything from agriculture to many of the things we enjoy most in our daily lives are really the products of the work of these little catalysts. And in fact, humans have taken enzymes out of their microbial context and applied them, engineered them, and applied them to a number of other things that nature never had in mind, including things that you use daily. All of these products contain enzymes. Not only are they enzymes, but they're engineered. That is, their sequences have been changed to make them better at a human job. How do you take stains off clothes? Well, nature never cared about taking stains off clothes, but humans care about it because that lowers the energy cost of doing laundry. All of these products have, engin have engineered enzymes made by directed evolution. And yes, I will tell you a little bit about what that is. And in fact, many other industries with which many of you may be familiar use engineered enzymes in those industries to lower the cost or the toxicity of those processes, from pulp and paper processing, processing of leather goods, textiles, even reducing the pollution from animal feed. Biotechnology has been used in all of these industries, and many of the enzymes have been modified for these applications. The application that interests me and that will be the subject of my brief discussion today is green chemistry. How do you replace difficult, expensive, and sometimes quite toxic chemical processes with clean processes that use biological systems. Biology is great because it works in water. No organic solvents, no toxic metal wastes. And the other great thing about biology is that it can use abundant renewable resources, sunlight, grasses, trees, biomass, even recycling waste materials from human activities. Biology is great at this. Biology uses everything. And now, with being able to engineer the molecules of life, we can consider converting those and doing a whole new chemicals industry that can convert those renewable resources into what we need. And this will allow us to stop pumping that wealth out of the ground. Right now, we get most of our products from oil-based resources, from fossil resources. And instead of pumping it out of the ground and dumping that carbon eventually into the atmosphere, we could do this in a renewable cycle. Another aspect of green chemistry is, of course, reducing the waste from current chemical processes. So when I look at a microbe, this is what I think about. I think of a microbe as the ultimate molecular chemical machine, a chemistry machine, a machine for making new molecules that's programmable. And that program, of course, is the DNA sequence, the DNA sequence that encodes the protein sequence that does the work. Let's rewrite that code. It's hard. And this is where the innovation came in. Because it was easy to say, I want to rewrite the code of life. What's really hard is doing it. And it's hard to do that because even a single enzyme, and bacteria have thousands of them, a single enzyme is so complicated that we don't understand what code gives the desired function, much less something better than what nature provided to you because these are strings of amino acids that fold into an intricate three-dimensional shape, and that shape is required to catalyze these reactions and speed up the chemistry so that it happens on a scale that instead of might take hundreds of thousands of years without a catalyst to a scale where it supports life 
supports the survival of the organism that makes it. And now we see that as we get better and better in our basic science, we can see that these things are in motion. They're doing things that we're only beginning to understand. So here's our problem. We want to engineer an intricate molecular machine, the product of evolution, not of human design. And we don't even understand how that function arises. So, we have a lot of technology, and this is what moves really quickly, the capabilities. When I was a graduate student, it was at the dawn of the DNA revolution. For the first time, we could go in and manipulate this DNA code, insert it into bacteria, they would read it, and they would spew out the protein that we had coded. But we didn't know what the code was. And I'll point out, today, 30 years later, we can now synthesize any DNA you want. You can email, and some of you may not know this, I know this is a general audience, but you can type out the sequence of essentially any DNA you want, except for maybe smallpox, that'll get you on a trouble list. But you can type out any DNA that you want, you can email that off to your favorite supplier in Taiwan, in Finland, in Northern California, and in a few days you will get back in the mail the physical DNA molecules. We have that capability now, and you've probably seen headlines of people who've synthesized entire genomes. So it's easy to synthesize the DNA. What we don't know, and what I've tried to explain, is that we don't know the code. And I look at the code even for an enzyme. It's like a beautiful symphony, a Beethoven symphony. Intricate, elegant, really touches you. And here we are just learning how to hold a pencil. So we don't know how to write that music. We can copy it from nature, we can read it, but we don't know how to make new code that will tell an enzyme how to do a better job, even at being a laundry detergent aid. All right, so what do we do? We look to the algorithm that's made all the functionality, the biological world that we enjoy today. It wasn't the product of human design. It's the product of a simple algorithm of making changes, random, very often, and then going through a filter of natural selection, iterated over millions of years, such that, and we can look at the sequences of proteins that exist today and build their whole genealogy. And we can see that these proteins came from a common ancestor, long time ago, and diversified through this evolutionary process to give us this entire spectrum of catalysts that you can literally scrape off the bottom of your shoe all through a simple algorithm of design called evolution. So the recognition was that, oh my goodness, here I am at Caltech, the expectations are really high, I have no clue what I'm doing. But there was a model to follow, and the technology became available to actually do this. So being in the right place at the right time helps. And having the students who are willing to take on a project that looks like molecular biology when they're supposed to be getting a PhD in chemical engineering. So that's what we did. We started evolving proteins in the laboratory, and the question is, can you do it on a time scale for a PhD thesis, or my God, you know, supporting an industrial process, those guys have absolutely no patience for you. So here, here is what we, we did. Now, you may get nervous about this and say, oh my goodness, genetic modification. But I would like to remind you that humans have been doing this for a great deal of years. For thousands of years, we have been modifying the biological world at the level of the DNA by practicing artificial selection. Everything from corn to carrier pigeons, lab rats, racehorses, we've been making things that solve our problems or please us and have no biological function whatsoever. In other words, they wouldn't show up in the natural world if we were not there to provide the environment for it. So we have been practicing breeding at the DNA level to solve human problems. Of course, the problem has been that in the natural world and in, even in the farmyard, the mechanisms for ch making changes in DNA have been limited. So worms go with worms, monkeys go with monkeys, and you don't cross monkeys and worms. It won't work, even if you try it. But you've just heard from me that you can synthesize any DNA you want, 
So you can start thinking about, well, gee, what would happen if I cross the DNA? I am not making a wolf bird. Do not get the wrong idea. I'm not crossing a wolf and a bird. I'm taking a DNA that encodes an enzyme from different species and recombining that in the test tube. Well, that's pretty fun. But you can imagine it also might be a little crazy making because the rules of breeding in nature have been well developed by nature so that, you know, when you cross a cat with a cat, you might get a few little diverse things, but you usually get functional cats. A human with a human, you might have functional children. But when you start taking DNA from very disparate sources, nobody knows what the rules are. So you might have three parents. Should I have 33 parents? How, sh how many mutations should I dial in? We don't know what these rules are, and that's what makes it exciting. Where can you go, and how do you turn that into something that makes something useful? That's really the challenge, because there's lots of places you can go that aren't useful. In fact, if you think the universe is big, think of all the possible ways you could write a DNA code for a protein. Protein's made up of 20 amino acids, It'll be a polymer chain a few hundred amino acids long. My goodness, that's a space that's so many times bigger than the number of particles in the universe that you can't even begin to conceive. It's even bigger than the U.S. national debt, which is about the biggest number we can even begin to conceive of. And even though I've explored the smallest fraction of it, I'll tell you that most of them don't do anything at all. Most of that space of possible proteins is not interesting. It doesn't encode a functional molecule, much less a molecule that will solve your problem. So here's our challenge. How do you optimize, how do you change an enzyme sequence using an evolutionary method when you're working in a space that's mostly empty? And that takes some thought. It's not a random process. It's not just trial and error. You actually have to think about it. And we think about it as a molecular optimization problem. And we all optimize in our daily lives. And in nature, nature has figured out how to do this by evolution. So we think of the performance of the enzyme as a measure of, in, of the y-axis, so to speak, in a fitness landscape. And on this axis, there'll be all the ways you can make a change to the sequence, so that it actually has thousands of dimensions, but I've collapsed it down to two so it'll fit on a slide. But that means we, if we're going to make an effective and improved protein, we have to have some idea of what this landscape looks like. Is it really sharp? Is it smooth? Because if the nature of that landscape will dictate how we search in that when we don't know where we're going. And in fact, I'm going to collapse lots of research down to one slide to summarize what I and many other laboratories that use evolutionary methods to engineer proteins have learned. And that is that the landscape is both smooth and rugged, but that in places where nature has explored, it is mainly smooth. In other words, around a protein that exists today are many other functional proteins that you can access by making a single mutation. And some of those mutations, most of the mutations are deleterious. They make it worse. But some of those mutations make it better. And your challenge is to find those rare beneficial mutations and then iterate on the process. So I call it an uphill walk climbing up this fitness landscape by an iterative process of mutation and artificial selection. A random uphill walk, if you would say. And that's a dumb search strategy. But you know what? It works really well. And it has given rise to all the most functional and beautiful objects in this room today, the microbes in your gut. All right. So how do you do this in the laboratory for those who really want to get in and do this, and whose high school students are doing it in, in their bio, biology laboratories. It's that simple, and it's that accessible now. We start with the DNA that encodes an enzyme that you literally can scrape off the bottom of your shoe. Many of the enzymes I work with are from soil microbes. They've solved a lot of interesting problems. Take the DNA that does that, and you just copy it. And you copy it using that enzyme I introduced at the very beginning that loves to copy DNA. It's a little machine to copy DNA, only you make it a little bit drunk. You make it make mistakes. You give it you know, a little alcohol in the system that'll cause it to make mistakes randomly. And you can make billions of copies, all of which have random mutations in them. 
That's the easy part. That'll take you 20 minutes. But then the hard part comes. Cells do that. They read the DNA, so you can put that DNA into microbes, recombinant DNA technology, around for 40 years. Microbes will read it, and they'll start making the proteins, each of which has mistakes in it. Now, next comes the hard part for the human being, and that's deciding who should go on to become the parent to the next generation. Who has improved by collecting one of your mutations? That's just hard work. You have to decide what are the criteria for that performance, and you measure it in a chemistry or, or with a uh, fluorescence or some measure of that performance. It's hard to perf measure performance, say, making money. That one's a tough one. But you can measure performance for many chemical tasks that enzymes have to do. And as I told you, most mutations are deleterious, so we just throw those out. But if you've chosen the right kind of problem, and here's where the interesting and tasteful part of the experiment comes in, that's defining a problem. I'm having trouble with this clicker here. It's defining a problem where a mutation gives you a measurable improvement in the performance. And when you can measure that improvement, when you're good enough at screening that you can measure that performance, you can find beneficial mutations. And then you can iterate. You can repeat the process. And sometimes we can do that once a day, or maybe once a week. And you can speed up the evolution to optimize the enzyme. So here's another way of looking at it, like that hill climbing. What we're doing is we're taking an enzyme from nature. It's very good at what it does. We're asking it to do a new job, take stains off of clothes. It's not very good at it. But through this process of accumulating mutations, we make it better until the problem has been solved. Until the graduate student gets the PhD, industry is happy, or we've shown new biological principle. I want to show you one of my favorite examples of this, because one of my first students, in fact, the first student to work on directed evolution, actually came to Helsinki to enjoy this event with me. Dr. Jeff Moore at Merck established a biocatalysis group and it established uh, directed evolution in Merck where they make citagliptin uh, to deal with the global problem of diabetes. Millions of, hundreds of millions of people suffer. Six, uh, what is it, 6% of the world population has diabetes. It's an enormous problem and one of uh, one of Merck's enormous products is citagliptin, which helps the natural mechanism for making insulin. So hundreds of millions of prescriptions are written for this, and it accounts for this citagliptin ingredient. It goes into products that account for $6 billion in sales. Well, this particular pharmaceutical is made at very large scale by a really complicated chemical process, and you don't have to read that chemical process that's shown up there to show you that there are many steps involved. And this was efficiently developed over many, of many years. But the problem with these chemical processes, and you'd be surprised, the pharmaceutical industry generates a lot of waste for every ton of pharmaceutical that they make. It would involve toxic metals, organic solvents, and even though it had been finely tuned in the process chemistry groups, Jeff's group saw an opportunity for replacing that and simplifying that, just replacing it all with a single enzyme. In fact, they went out and found an enzyme that was catalyzed a related reaction. So they hypothesized that we could replace this product. Jeff and his collaborators at Codexis went out and found an enzyme that catalyzed a related reaction. Then they used directed evolution over multiple generations to improve it, not fivefold or tenfold, but 70,000-fold, because it was being asked to do a really different job from what it did. And that enabled them to improve the yield from the starting materials, to remove all of the toxic he heavy metals from the process, and to reduce all the solvent waste by 60%. So that process is now in place. It was approved by the FDA in 2012, and it was so good that it really led the way for the entire pharmaceuticals industry to, to start implementing these biological routes in place of chemical processes. So that won the presidential Green Chemistry Award, as well as a Thomas Edison Patent Award. 
And it's, it remains probably the most compelling example of how directed evolution could make a catalyst that really would be useful. Another problem that I'm very interested in, coming from my background in the alternative energy field, was how do you make things that we need in large quantities, like fuels, from renewable resources, like grasses or uh, trees, cellulose. And that's a hard problem, because when biology breaks down cellulose, it uses a little molecular machine called a cellulase, and fungi spew those out into the environment, but they're pretty sluggish. And they, in fact, they're sluggish enough that it's economically not very, let's say, it's not attractive enough to use these enzymes to make biofuels. And here I want to take a minute to introduce a colleague of mine, Pim Stemmer, with whom I shared the Draper Prize of the U.S. National Academy in uh, 2011. Pim Stemmer had some wonderful ideas in directed evolution. And unfortunately, he passed away in 2013, way too young, because he went on after doing his work to found multiple new companies, and we miss him dearly. But he had a marvelous idea in directed evolution. So we collaborated in the late 90s, and I became involved in his startup company, which we licensed our technology to in the late 90s. But Pim had a marvelous idea, which was to do sex in a test tube. So I've told you about random mutations. He liked the idea because he came from a different branch of science of recombining DNA from different species in order to explore new sequences. And so another way to do the search strategy, to this, do this molecular optimization, would be able to be to take DNA from different species and create chimeric sequences. And here I've illustrated it with three different parents, but you could have 33 parents if you like. And those chimeric proteins would populate a different kind of uh, fitness landscape. So here we might start with three proteins that went through the process of evolution, and when you recombine those, you can make lots of progeny proteins that kind of look like their parents, but are different, and they populate different fitness peaks. And what's really nice is that those chimeric proteins are slightly different from their parents. Some of you might realize that, yes, your children might look like you, but they may be a little bit smarter than you at some things. And that's what we rely on when we recombine this DNA, that a few of the children are actually better than their parents. And that novelty comes from this new sequence exploration. So getting back to the cellulases, we took fungal enzymes that are all evolved by nature to work at moderate temperatures. There are no fungi that live in volcanic vents or you know, halothermophilic hot springs but we could make a version of the fungal enzyme that was very stable just by recombining these mesophilic enzymes. And what that allowed us to do was find sequences that work at higher temperatures. And if you remember back to your high school chemistry, if you work at higher temperatures and you're a catalyst, your reaction will go faster. So simply by making it more stable, we could make the reaction twice as fast with these enzymes. And when you're using train load quantities of enzymes to break down cellulose, half a train load starts looking pretty good. So those are examples of, of what directed evolution has done, and I can summarize a lot of the things that we learned over 25 years of this. Proteins adapt, no surprise, but they adapt in real time. They adapt by the simple process of accumulating mutations. They adapt quickly. Only a tiny fraction of the sequence needs to change to get these functional changes. We didn't know that before, that this evolution could happen so fast. Scary fact for the would-be designers is that most of the mutations we don't understand. They happen far away from the working part of the enzyme, yet they propagate their effects to the so-called active site. We can't even explain what those mutations do, much less predict them. So the would-be designers, I challenge you to do better than what evolution does. So we can summarize some of these ideas so far by saying that directed evolution is a great optimization strategy. And it works in real time. Okay, so what's the future? Well, one future that I love and that I'm exploring is, well, optimization is one thing. If you can scrape an enzyme off your shoe that does a nice reaction, you can improve it. People buy that now. 
That's almost a given in the field, that you can improve it for some new job. But what if nature has not created what you want? What if there is no enzyme that catalyzes the reaction that you're interested in? And why would you care? Because human chemists have been very clever. In the last 200 years of chemistry, human chemists have discovered, especially recently, have discovered catalysts for reactions that nature could care less about and hasn't developed, but that humans care about and would be very important for the industries of today. So how do you make something that's not known in nature? How does evolution do that? How does a conservative process like sex or making one mutation actually give you novelty? Well, this is a question that's asked in all of evolution. How do new species arise, right? It's kind of like this speciation problem. How does the novelty of a new species arise by a conservative process? We know it did, right? We know that evolution did it, but it's hard to catch nature in the act of doing it, and no one has been able to breed this novelty. So that's the, the interesting question for the recent future. But when you think about it, nature does this all the time, even in real time, right? Nature is full, I said this yesterday, uncountable organisms working 24-7 for the last three billion years to solve a huge array of problems so that all these enzymes came about by this pro these conservative processes. This is the ultimate in crowdsourcing of problem solving, and I will tell you it happens in real time. Anybody who worries about antibiotic resistance knows this already, but there are many other interesting examples where evolution has happened in real time in the biological world as a result of human action. So consider atrazine, a potent herbicide that's only been on this planet for 60 years or so. We've dumped billions of pounds of this into the natural environment and was first considered to be non-biodegradable. Then about 1993, Organisms started eating the stuff, living on it, and getting, using it for a nitrogen source so that it provided a new niche for the organism that discovered the enzyme that catalyzes that removal of that chlorine. And that happened in real time. Only two mutations from an existing enzyme was able to do that. Here's another example. Maybe you saw this headline three weeks ago. Researchers discover bacteria that eat plastic bottles. Haven't you been hoping, hoping for that for the last 20 years? When well, nature solved the problem, nature evolved an enzyme that can degrade PET plastics, allowing the organisms that solve this problem to live on plastic bottles. Now we can go to that organism, take the starting DNA, and I hope in the future that people will use directed evolution to speed up that process and create new microbes that can do that at industrial scale to recycle these plastics. So nature does it, why can't I do it? So that's the question that we asked ourselves about five years ago. How do I create a new enzyme? It catalyzes a reaction known in nature. The answer is that it's already there. New things come about because novelty is already there in this uncountable space of living things that exist in the world. That's why nature can adapt this diversity of DNA out there is just waiting for a new opportunity. And so in this, this idea of using a fitless landscape, we've got an enzyme that catalyzes a reaction really well. But it also can do other things, right? You may be selected in your job today because you're a really good lawyer, but you also know how to play the piano. And someday when you're out of a lawyer job, maybe you can go and play the piano or wash dishes or something, but you're able to do multiple things. Same is true for the catalysts in the biological world. They can do multiple things. And when the opportunity to live on atrazine comes, that little bit of activity gets grabbed by evolution and re-optimized in a form of directed evolution to give the organisms the chance to occupy that new niche. So we can do this in the laboratory. In recent years, we've shown, for example, that existing heme enzymes that have one job in nature, which is to transfer oxygen, can also be convinced through directed evolution to become excellent catalysts for transferring carbons and nitrogens. 
These are reactions never before known in the biological world. In fact, are not relevant biologically and couldn't even be catalyzed biologically because we provide man-made resources to make it happen, just like the atrazine case, just like the plastic bottles. We can provide those resources and the proteins learn quickly how to do this new chemistry. Here's an example of what we've been able to do with that. This molecule here, this triangle, that's called a cyclopropane. That's a functionality only chemists thought they could make. When you take a double bond and you turn it into a triangle, humans thought that this belonged to them. Enzymes perfectly happy to do this chemical reaction. They do it quickly when you convince them by directed evolution to become more uh, more efficient, and we were able to show within a year that we could evolve an enzyme to make the core of an FDA-produced drug that's uh, used to treat clinical depression. That's just one example. Here's another example of real novelty that's created silicon. Ah, this is responding very slowly here. Nope. Um, jumping, there we go. Silicon. You ever wondered, 2% of the elements in the, nat in the world is silicon. There's no organosilicon compounds in biology. Biology never figured out how to make things with silicon in it. But human chemists know how to do it. And in fact, they've been using silicon in everything from organic LEDs for television sh sets to new catalysts and drugs. It's a very useful uh, set, of, uh, set of molecules. Humans can do it, and now the biological world can do it. We discovered a protein that comes from an organism that lives in high salt, high temperature conditions that's happy to make silicon carbon bonds. And through the process of evolution, we could make it do that very quickly. Nature never cared about it, but I care about it, and now that novelty can be drawn off for new chemistry. All right. In fact, that was uh, presented at an AC American Chemical Society conference just recently, and the reporters all loved it and showed this Star Trek picture of finding life inside of rocks. Well, I'm not putting life inside of rocks. I'm putting rocks inside of life. All right. So here's the basic idea that I've tried to share with you. We have today in the biological world a set of proteins that are relevant to biology. That's a tiny fraction of all the possible proteins. Biology's only explored the tiniest fraction of the possibilities. There's a whole space of molecules out there that will solve the, that, that will solve the cure to cancer, the solution to the energy crisis. Your job is to find those and to find the search strategies where you can explore through recombination, mutation, and probably other methodologies to evolve these molecules to support human life. And what are the things that you can do with it? These are just to end, if I can get this thing to work. Proteins that will mimic human proteins. We can use bacterial proteins to mimic the human liver, to find catalysts that will, can be used to test drug toxicity. So we can actually mimic the metabolism in your liver to test new drug candidates to see if they're toxic. We can find humanized enzymes that can be used to treat cancer. All right, we can make proteins that can be used to control brain, that can be used to monitor activity in the brain and to control even the firing of neurons in a living animal. Proteins can do that in the field of optogenetics. We can make fluorescent proteins that shine at all colors of the rainbow in fact, Roger Chen won the Nobel Prize for this using directed evolution in 2008, changing the face of biology because now we can image where proteins go in real time in living in cells. And finally, we can use proteins to solve some of the most important problems of our society. One of the projects that I'm working on now is coming up with new ways to combat pests in agriculture without dumping pesticides into, into our fields. And finally, the bioeconomy that I mentioned, using microorganisms with engineered enzymes to make the products we need of our daily lives. So I'd like to conclude then 
by reminding you that nature is this innovation machine. We have this capability to rewrite the code of life. It doesn't have to be a new opportunity for exploitation, right? It should be an opportunity for exploration and for coming up with real solutions to the problems that we have, because it really is a source of innovation. And if you want to be an innovator, work with systems like this. It'll do it for you. Just give it a little sugar. And I would like to finally thank the people who are behind all this work. Uh, there we go. Um, this is done by people, right? I've highlighted microorganisms, but people do this work. Young people do this work. They love to innovate. They love to train organisms to do whole new things. And this is my group, actually a couple years ago at the California Institute of Technology. And I thank you again for coming. I thank you for this marvelous prize, members of the selection committee, members of the Finnish population. You support this prize, and it's truly an amazing thing. Thank you.